Good evening, everyone. I think we're we're running. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam. I'm the director of UKS, and I'm here today with Admir Patlak for this uh, 42nd, I believe, how to practice, which is a uh, our uh, walk-in workshop or like chill conversation, evening conversation with soup. Um, and we're here with you, Admir. Finally, we've been wanting to do this talk for a really long time, so it's great that we can finally do it today. Um, we're going to talk about big life-altering decisions <laughs> um, and other and fashion and other stuff too. But um, I'll just say a little practical thing. Admir and I will talk for about half an hour, 40 minutes, I think, and then we'll open to questions. So if you do have any questions, um, we'd like you to save them for the end. Yeah. Um, and we're joined tonight also by this lovely creature, which is very exciting that we uh, we don't often install work for, uh, for how to practice, but we've done so today. It was your idea to bring this uh, work, so we'll get back to this later on in the talk, but maybe uh, you want to start by just introducing yourself. Um, hey, uh, my name is Admi Batlak. I'm um, 41 years old and I'm, um, I'm born in Bosnia, Herzegovina. And I came to know when I was 11. And my background is in fashion design and also working with kind of presenting collections in an art context. But in the last four or five years, the war kind of evolved more into, I guess, uh, being art. <laughs> yeah, working more with like sculpture and uh, yeah, textile. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is exactly this shift between spheres or fields or yeah. worlds, which I'm uh, very interested in for different personal reasons as well which we can get back to, but maybe you want to say, um, so you've been, maybe you can say what kind of drew you, because even when you were, so you trained as a designer, fashion designer, yeah. but even when you worked as a fashion designer, you would bring fashion into galleries. Can you talk maybe a little bit about how you, like what it, how you got interested in showing your work in that context and also what it was maybe about that context that you felt gave you something different than the the sort of normal fashion outlets. Okay, I have to say also, I'm I really don't know that much about fashion. I yeah. I'm very afraid now of saying something wrong. So so uh, maybe just correct me if I wanted to say like on the catwalk, but I'm sure that's very that's not correct. Um, but from yeah, the like kind from of fashion kind, outlets, I think I started kind of uh, showing works in an art space quite early. Already, uh, I think the first time was in 2008 while I was working with Charlie Selvig. I don't know, at one point we just like approached Galerie Ries <laughs> because they had this kind of amazing space. <laughs> And um, so it was more like a really kind of shallow reason because we wanted to show in like a great space. Um, none of us I don't, so were really kind of relating to the contemporary art context at that point, besides that we were kind of like hanging out with people that were artists. <laughs> um, and. Um, yeah, and I think they kind of, we had, we just had a lunch at the gallery and I kind of just liked what we were like talking about and how we wanted to do a show because it was always kind of like working with the presentation and yeah, I guess we were like talking about act the actual work and and then what, I guess quite early, we were made quite aware that maybe our process wasn't that different from like an art process in a way. So yeah, we did this kind of show that was both happening like inside and outside of the gallery. 
Yeah, so we're just kind of like... It's not my feeling that gaining access to galleries is normally this easy. No, but that's what exactly how we... I know you're not like never supposed to contact or galleries or whatever, but I think we were just kind of ignorant about that because we were not coming from the art field, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you and it's you still like, work with that gallery, right? So you know, I mean, something must. Yeah, have been, right? so that was kind of start of something that is, yeah, still working and very well. And then, okay, so this was like the first encounter with the art wor art world, I guess. And you were, and maybe you should introduce this uh, person that you just mentioned, Charlie Selvig. Charlie, yeah, mm. we uh, met during high school and just became kind of very good friends. And she left to London after school and I went to Milan, but we kind of kept this dream to kind of coming back to Norway and like, you know, conquering <laughs> the fashion scene, which was kind of, I mean, I don't want to say non-existent because it was like existent, but, but it's not a, like a super developed field. It's, it still isn't. And then you started a brand. Yeah, mm. and we were together for four years. And then I had a break for a couple of years. I worked at Kiyo, my tutoring, and then 2013, I started like doing collections like just by myself. So, so that lasted you for doing five that? years, okay. and then like the whole kind of transition into art started happening, yeah. Can we talk about a little bit about this dream of conquering the fashion world? Yeah. The Norwegian... Um, or I think one thing that I'm interested in generally in like the artistic life or like the creative life is this um, discrepancy, I guess, between... I think everyone has dreams, right? And everyone comes to this world with dreams. And then as you progress through a career or a work life, you find out that maybe those dreams can't come true or maybe those dreams were never actually like they were dreams. They weren't they didn't have anything to do with any kind of reality. And I think that can be quite. I mean, for I think that's a disappointing thing, right, when you find out when you find that out. And one of the things we've been talking about yeah. while we've been preparing for this talk yeah. that I'm super interested in, and you, I, th I think maybe you find it a little less uh, dramatic than I do somehow, is um, is this kind of the shift from one career to another or from one sphere or world to another. Um, so I'd love to talk a little bit about because you've kind of you've left mostly the fashion world now and you your work now is as an artist. Yeah. Uh, and I'm really interested in that. But maybe I can just start somewhere else to say when I was uh, when Admir and I were uh, working on the little piece of text that's in the um, that's in the description for today, I had written Admir left his glamorous career in the fashion scene and you said it was never very glamorous please change it to yeah. unglamorous yeah just like and maybe tone it down. <laughs> yeah. maybe could you talk a little bit like about the unglamorous nature of fashion i mean uh, i think when you have this kind of studio based <clears throat> practice and you work alone it's not that much different from like being a you know fine artist or craft art uh, so you know you just like in the studio you're making work happen <laughs> and um, yeah and I think my practice kind of really remained at that point yeah there was like this kind of time when I started doing more commercial collections and trying to like selling to stores but it felt kind of very unsatisfying so it kind because of, because i don't i don't think my strength is like making i do think that i have made some like 
nice garments, you know, but I don't, I do think that my strength is kind of, uh, I don't know, developing fabric, pushing it somewhere where it's, where it maybe hopefully it hasn't been, you know? So it's like, and it's also like a big kind of task to create these great shows, but then also have like something that is like desirable to wear. So it just like became kind of too much. And I, I guess I was much more interested in like creating these kind of moments. And did you ever, because, so this was something I said to you as well, when you Google, when I Google you, yeah. what comes up is like, ran several brands, uh, won all these awards, fancy pictures. Um, but it doesn't sound like it felt like that. In a way it sounds, you when, I mean, this is, it sounds like you did everything right, but you still left. So what was it that apart from like not being satisfied with, for example, this commercial outlet, what, what kind of happened? What, when did you start thinking this world isn't for me? Um, I don't know if it like happened that drastically, but I also kind of always fought against this kind of type of success because I think I like re read one somewhere that like commercial success is like kind of beginning of the end. <laughs> so it's like uh, it became, I don't know, like um, not something that I, I knew it had to be about the work, you know, and at that kind of pace delivering like two collections a year, it had to be like good. <laughs> To continue, and I think that was like my focus. Mm. The was actual work, and was it a long successes like that, like continuing? You know, I I really do believe that, but like I still work. <laughs> and and was it a long process, like this? Well, leaving, as I said, I started kind fashion. of like exploring. Well. Um, I think the big part of a practice of my practice was kind of challenging this show format because um, it was always doing a lot with like very little in a way because there was no budget <laughs> ever. So there were like these ideas, you know, like having models um, walk on the street or like start exhibiting kind of pieces of clothes of sort of kind of objects of crafts or like having shows that like were no music or like kind of maybe cutting down on theatrics of or like a show. So there will be like shows with like no styling. And then I started kind of not having a front row and um, then was about like exhibiting um, models kind of installing them as sculptures that it was just like kind of i don't know sounds like you were being out i think it was always kind of testing sounds a little bit like you were also peeling off the layers yeah <laughs> until you kind of and then i guess what you're left with in a way is the material yeah yeah that's maybe right yeah exactly the work mm. itself and then I don't know, there was, um, yeah, maybe there was like a feeling. I, I, there is this one thing that I kind of always go back to because there was a teacher at school that says like every designer has 10 good years. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and wait, so were I you like at nine and a half? Charlie and five with myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that was not like the kind of, what kind of, yeah, how would you say, like? The, like the primary reason? Yeah, it was just, I don't know, I was more interested in kind of exploring, like, I think when you work with fashion, it's like a suggestion for of something for somebody else. And, you know, and like, I think I started maybe being interested more in my own history and like myself. <laughs> and uh, 
somehow that felt more right kind of treating that like away from a model body or like yeah and also like you said it was like pushing kind of fabric and what that could be so was it ever nostalgic for you to leave behind fashion or maybe not nostalgic but like sad um, or do you not think about it as in something you've just completely left behind no because i'm still in the same room working you know there are quite similar processes i think uh, i think there's something about the craft that it has been kind of intensified maybe when i'm doing um sculpture because i it doesn't have this aspect of maybe like practicality or wearability or so i think that has kind of gotten gotten more yeah intense it has a round of like yeah it yeah it's got more layers to it maybe now is a great time to to talk a little bit about this this uh yeah sculpture that's here with us today yeah it's a work that's almost kind of entirely made of sequence and it's from uh, last year right yeah it's from last year yeah and the title is uh fake a patna deal break a vibe yeah four yeah four so it's uh, like a series of five sculptures um yeah, and kind of showcases what i do with fabric i guess most of the material comes like from a roll of fabric i buy existing materials i don't do anything kind of from scratch so these are like sequenced by border grandland uh, so you buy like do you generally buy quite cheap materials or is or does that I vary? Think it's both, but there's something. I've always been kind of interested in something that maybe looks more like frivolous or fluffy or fake in some way. Uh, so what so I do, like I, I say that, like the iron, the steamer is my main tool. So kind of all my fabric treatment and like happens through like with iron i say that i paint with the iron that i weld with the iron so it's kind of like changing the character of a material it has this kind of aspect kind of also now kind of having fabric simulate kind of building material mm. in a way so it has this it's about kind of masculinating the sequin but then also kind of demasculinating the building material in a way maybe we should just um like do a, a how it's done a, a, a little um just for the people maybe watching at home who don't see it so well maybe it's nice to just kind of do a little description of this work so it's a <coughs> cylinder yeah and a square i guess yeah I guess, yeah. Uh, and what maybe you can't see at home is that both the cylinder and the top bit here is made of sequins. Yeah. But here the sequins are covered with, what are they covered with? The, they're covered with a PVC foil that I also apply with an iron. So that so makes it melt, I guess, into the yeah. sequins. So I kind of like also with a mask. <laughs> burn some of the pvc off to have this kind of like patinated lived look which is kind of like faking a patina mm. <laughs> and uh, it looks almost it it gets a bit of a kind of animal like snake skin feel yeah but also definitely you do okay yeah but also of course uh i mean some of these but bits I mean, are they kind are of like yucky scales or yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and this. And then up here, it's a very kind of thick hard. coating yeah. of um, of sequence. It's basically kind of welding sequence that are lay flat, kind of closer together, so they kind of go into this kind of fur position in a way. Mm -hmm. It's like welding sequence into furs, you know. Um, and then there's these, uh, this like long kind of stripe almost of, yeah, what is this metal? It's, it's, an, it's this elastic steel material that is used primarily in like garment making, corsetry and undergarments like huge crinolines that are like historical. Um, so it is this kind of material that, yeah, that mm. shapes the body, but here it kind of like, I guess, kind of opens up to like the wing kind of shape. And, and gives, yeah. well, but it still shapes a body, I yeah. guess, in a way where it's, way, with you, I, you said to me that this was a kind of butterfly. <laughs> Maybe I'm making, th maybe yeah, this is no, too banal. Yeah, 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 yeah but yeah, the, <coughs> the, the, some banality is okay, I think. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Um, but in terms of kind of uh, being the like skeleton of wings. one body and then becoming the skeleton of another body, yeah. I guess, is what I wanted to. I've been interested in like wings for a while because uh, I've been working with the socialist monuments from where I come from, mm -hmm. Slavia, and this kind of wing aspect that has this kind of celebratory triumphant kind of aspect so I, yeah so there's is it because there's a lot of wings in these monuments yeah i never thought about this connection but i've looked quite a bit at these monuments and they're obviously also super formal yeah often very very big very uh yeah. heavy yeah they're like these great kind of architectural and artistic masterpiece almost yeah but mm. they're in concrete and stone and so there was this kind of i started working with the steel for the triennial because uh because i was like researching the monuments and they were that had been like destroyed so they had their like inner structures coming out so I, started thinking that were metal so i started, started thinking what that would be for somebody who works with like fashion textile so that's kind of how the crinoline came into which part is the crinoline yeah is that's, that, that's no that's this is it ah, like the, this is i crinoline. call it crinoline okay. because it's kind of different yeah it's like a steel type. but of course a really big difference between those monuments and this work <clears throat> is like the temporality of the monument the, the monument they've sat there for now 70 years they're falling yeah, apart the first game like f 50s yeah. yeah 1950s yeah so, yeah, so 70 yeah. some years um and many of them are falling apart they're really like dilapidated uh, and i don't know that they're being kept so well right are they well some are it's <coughs> kind of a complicated yeah. yeah also doesn't isn't so important maybe for for us right now but my point is the durability and the temporality of those works are is very different from the durability and temporality of this work which is much more uh you know short-lived i think why no why do you think that? i don't know I, yeah I just mean, like cement versus plastic. Well, I guess not <laughs> plastic, actually. It's what keeps together. Maybe I'm, I, maybe I'm really wrong. Might be. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think about them as the same kind of? What's, this is like fifth time it's being installed. I think it's like, <laughs> I don't know. I took it on the bus today. <laughs> So it's like, uh, yeah, I think it can, um, I think it can last. I guess garments generally, not, not that this is a garment, but yeah, garments, of course, Because that has like a wearability aspect. Yes, and you don't think 
I think one doesn't think of it as something that will survive through centuries. Of course, it does sometimes, but often it doesn't because fabric is just uh, textile is more. Uh, yeah, like uh, it's not like the standy. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I was thinking, <laughs> like, uh, ugh, can't find the word. Doesn't yeah. matter. Um, but of course, when you're looking at these kinds of textiles, they do have a very long, maybe not in one piece, but but they do have a, a very long temporality. Yeah, it's like I, I don't, it's not something that I consider too much, I think. Also, I think the quality of something it can be in s something else than just how long it lasts in a way. I think that's also kind of true in garment making because the most kind of exquisitely made things you can't like put them in the machine you know <laughs> so the quality is kind of yeah yeah and this is part of a series of works yeah there's five of them yeah so i guess when i do they all are kind of like get a look or become characters in a way so this one like <laughs> yeah, decide to be rusty or <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah and do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about the show they were in and the kind of wh what you were exploring in that show it was a show at a uh, soft gallery which is the textile gallery of in Oslo last yeah. summer was it mm? yeah well the fabric development is uh, or like the textile treatment is a huge part of it. But I also think I work in this kind of collage or reference. So there'll be like everything from kind of like, you know, the monuments to like more, I don't know, dating apps <laughs> even, you know, there's like the deal breaker vibe kind of. Uh, and it is also kind of like this idea of kind of, you know, fucking with ideals in a way, messing that up. And I'm, yeah. And what are you working on now? Um, right now I'm wo working on um, on uh, Solo Oslo for Munch. Which it's is an kind of a big deal. Yeah, it's an exhibition that kind of opens in, um, yeah, end September. And for those who are watching online, we can say that Munch is a, is a big museum here in Oslo. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Solo Oslo is a, is a series of exhibitions with young artists who get a solo show at the Monk Muse Museum. And you've been working on it for about a year? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, in my head. Are you, are, okay. <laughs> are you allowed to tell us about what you're doing? Yeah, I can say, I mean, I can say what I know that I'm doing. Yeah. Kinda, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it is a show in this space in the 10th floor that is kind of a very tall room and it also has like this kink wall. <laughs> um, so it kind wait, of wait, slopes. I, yeah. Yeah. So I think, it's yeah. Not a, it's not a, yeah, it's a wall that slopes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I am like considering that architecture, I guess, for my work. And how is that, um, what does that produce for you? Do you know yet? Or like, does that, or maybe another way of asking, is there a sequence in the show? Yeah, there's a lot of sequence <laughs> in the show. And what do they do there? Or maybe a better question is actually, how are you, w how are you working differently in this process? 
than in previous processes? Uh, what I think was quite different is that I think it started much more with like a clear idea, a sketch, which is not very uh, common for me, I guess, because I always try to delay decisions because I'm always kind of hoping for a better solution. Now I think it's like three months prior to the opening, I'd still, it's kind of like um, truthful to like the original plan in a way, mm -hmm. which has been, um, it is being kind of reshaped and remodeled, but I think the, yeah, the positioning of the work and its cons consideration of like the room, it has remained. And I guess I'm quite kind of happy about that. Is it more uh, installatory than sculptural this time? Because th so this work was presented in a in a room, kind of five uh, yeah. unique objects, right? That were they were hung from walls, yeah. leaning, uh, and kind of took in the room in a kind of horseshoe formation, I mm. guess. And is that is this one more of a kind of installation? Or do you still I don't have know. I've started discreet? production right now. I moved to Ekili, Monks Hall that layer. So um, I don't know how it's going to be resolved yet. One of the things we were discussing just now, and which I'm trying to get at here, is also kind of uh, risk taking. Yeah. You were saying you admire artists who take risks in the face of uh, of big challenges. And we were discussing how often I think it can be um, seductive to stay, to play it a little safe when you're in a context where there's a lot of other uncertainties. Like you might be in, I think it's the same probably for for artists who exhibit here at UKS who, you know, they don't know exactly what context they're coming into, what it is that you're kind of, what can, what you can expect. And maybe it feels, although I think everyone wants to do something spectacular or do something super interesting, of course, uh, I can also understand why you might think, okay, let, I'll give myself a break because there's so many unknowns. Um, doesn't sound like that that's what you're doing but I do think I am kind of trying to understand what I am actually doing you mm -hmm. know because like what um, like what spectacular means to me in a way so it's yeah and I yeah I, that I think there is like something very kind of good about getting a bit sick of yourself. And I, I think I have had like this kind of career where I've done that a lot. Gotten sick of yourself. Yeah, I think I'm more calm now. It's not that, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but in this kind of uh, show, there's so many new layers to the scale and to so I'm also thinking that as something new so we'll see we'll see I think production time for me is kind of like yeah anything can happen so I don't know like uh, anything can happen in a good way or in a bad way no it, it has to be good yeah <laughs> Can you, um, one of the things we wrote in the text is how do you stay calm in the face of big challenges? Do you, but, but you seem kind of okay. Well, I mean, I think one big challenge of course is, uh, is, the, is the having a big solo exhibition. Um, I'm thinking also maybe a big challenge is like making big life decisions, big life altering decisions. Um, do you have like do you have ways of like staying calm? I go swimming. 
Yeah. Yeah, I might do that as well. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> do that on Saturday. But um, I don't know, like uh, making something work in the studio really calms me down, <laughs> to be honest. Mm. I think that's... Um, Problem solving. Yeah. So that's what makes but me But what the then if you calm. can't make it work? I think there's always a solution in a way. <laughs> you were saying before that um, like... Or like scrap because the, the, yeah, just like it's also okay to... But is, do you think that might be a, like a kind of legacy from design actually? I think... To find solutions? To find solutions but also to be ready to scrap ideas. I have a feeling that design practices generally are a little bit better at rather than art practices at like testing things no it doesn't work moving on new idea test this yeah. it doesn't work new idea there, there was def there is definitely <coughs> this kind of uh, yeah mentality of always being ready because especially during fittings when models come in to try on clothes and if something doesn't work you have to be you know have like 10 ideas of how to kind of make it work so it does have that aspect of um, yeah that's so I kind of yeah that's that kind of calmed me down maybe in a way it sounds like quite a helpful approach actually rather than like getting stuck with something getting stuck with a material or stuck with an idea yeah Yeah, I, I think it's uh, just, it's good <laughs> to like um, not be stuck in a way. I also have a lot of processes that take a lot of time, like welding sequence <laughs> will take, so I can, if I'm stuck, I can just go to the actual <laughs> like craft part of making a fabric. Escape. Essentially, escape what's not working. Yeah, escape into more work in a way. <laughs> but then that can, uh, yeah, because you know, solutions do also kind of enter when you're also not maybe looking for them, or I don't know. Yeah, I think that's true. We're uh, going to slowly wrap up. Um, I, for one, am very uh, surprised and relieved to hear that the kind of clarity, I think I was expecting some kind of more dramatic story of like, and then I couldn't do it anymore and I just, everything changed. But it's a very... It would have made for like a more interesting talk, probably. Well, <laughs> mm, Maybe. Funner, yeah. Well, I mean, it would have made for more of a, for a more dramatic talk. Yeah, much but, more dramatic talk. But you yeah. know, I think everyone gets sick of what they're doing once in a while, right? And then you uh, or everyone. I'm definitely talking about myself now. Uh, and then sometimes, like I, because there's so much. I think, like in any any field, has its complications, and sometimes you think one thinks there's no way of like solving these complications, I'm just gonna do something else. Uh, and then there's a whole dream of like what a life could be. But it feels very, for me when I think about that, that also feels very sad and difficult. Mm -hmm. But this doesn't really feel that sad and difficult, your journey, it feels very kind of natural. I think my goal is to, have a studio practice in mm. a way <laughs> and I think I've had that mm. and rem I imagine like I've uh, um, yeah I maintain that I have and, and it also sounds like you're actually very interested in or you know you're quite specific about what you're interested in and that has led you like you're interested in the textile, for example, and how that can develop. And that leads you to different places, for example, not having a first row or, you know, working sculpturally. Yeah. 
I um, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to add to that. But yeah, just yeah, it's working is kind of yeah for me it is kind of making studio to that kind of place where I want to be. So I have continuously done that. And when when they stop being garments, they started being something else, but it's still like where I want to be in a way. That so because I don't, yeah, like I, I have probably said s terrible things about fashion, but I think it's a, it is a good field, you know, it is a very kind of valuable field. It has its qualities, just like wasn't for me anymore. Thank you. Thank you. We uh, would love to hear questions if there are any in the audience. So yeah, there are some new time. Maybe you can speak into this. Maybe I can. I can. I can. Thank you. Thank you for the conversation. I wanted to ask about scale. Scale. Because you moved from the body to another kind of body. Yeah. And I don't know how tall you are, but I imagine that this piece is just as tall as you are. Maybe it's taller than you. Yeah. But I'm just certain that scale is important. And mm -hmm. I just would love for you to speak about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, the first sculpture project I did was kind of started with pattern pieces from textual garments. Um, so there was this kind of maybe I don't know kind of relating to that scale but then erasing kind of the traces of the garment in a way and then it was also kind of working in a room that was three meters long so you kind of like pushed it till its limit but scale in terms of what I'm doing now, I think it, uh, yeah, it does kind of like, or this piece. Whichever you want. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can kind of, I don't know. I think that, that has been kind of my, What I think has been the most challenging for me was, is to kind of get scale or proportion right. Mm -hmm. I, speci I especially kind of felt that during the sculpture triennial, the, the, the sculptures that were outside. Um, that I had to kind of make bigger than my actual studio allowed me. And I kind of ended up not seeing them work as well as uh, I hope they would. Um, so I think the scale for me is kind of right now is kind of pushing the limit to where I can actually see the work and consider it continuously before it's being exhibited. Yeah. I don't know how much I think of like the actual body, though you might say it's like a lower body and an upper body. And um, am I answering any of your? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so scale for me, yeah, is something to kind of master because it has always been kind of like tiny, you know, knee to neck or longer or shorter or like this type of shoulder, but I... And very dictated, I guess, by something that is yeah. the human body. But right now I'm kind of trying to push that, but within kind of my limit to be able to like consider its quality, I think. I think that's very important for me. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is not like a follow-up. 
maybe like um, um, uh, another like another variation of your question. But I was just thinking like when you thank you so much for this conversation. It was it's really nice to listen to you to talk about your work. Um, but I was just wondering. Because I guess like this transition from the body to um, an, a non-body, m- maybe like a space, uh, like mm. it, it has like, I mean, when I see like the works that I've seen from you, not, not everything, but uh, like um, some of them, um, I I I th- I, rem- I just re- told you like I remember that I first when I first saw your show at Ries I I think that I kind of saw your sculptures more as sites or like mm. pl- places uh, yeah. I- in in a way and and when when I'm looking at this work like right now I'm also kind of almost r- registering it as a as a place yeah. uh, and um, but that's maybe like the monumentality yeah. part of it yeah. Because you have like this uh, architectonic kind of like a quality in in the way that uh, like both in the material that I've seen that you have like chosen mm. to work with, but also like how you uh, s- sc- you know work with with them like as well. So I just wa- wa- I, w- I, w- I was just wondering if uh, you could talk a bit more <laughs> about uh, about uh, like uh, um, uh, like. Because I guess that the body is like uh, in a way kind of restrictive in like in mm. how to handle like um, m- materials in a way because it's uh, because of its functionality of actually being able to wear it. But when you work with the space, like um, it it doesn't have the same types of restrictions. Mm. And I was just wondering, uh, like how how you th- how. Yeah, just like the transaction between these two, like body, space, place, <laughs> as a body. I, I don't know, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, that's um, a lot to think about, but it's... Um, Um, I don't know. I do think about like a certain pose, I think, <laughs> that the piece has to strike like a pose yeah. in a way, and then I try to freeze that. Yeah. I th- I've heard that like some people think it's kind of elegant in a way, and I think that's interesting to me in a way, yeah. that there's this kind of... Um, Uh, element of that kind of like striking a pose or yeah. something yeah so um, and I, I, yeah and I think maybe thinking of the space is quite new to me because I've always kind of trusted maybe that like a good work will be good anywhere maybe so yeah, I think Munch is like a test. Yeah. Yeah, you can imagine. Is there something that I kind of didn't catch? But the, no, yeah, no, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. M- more comment than a question. <laughs> I think I always kind of try to see it from everywhere and then there's like, you know, with sculpture there's always kind of like angles that don't work. And uh, I almost try to be kind of forgiving in a way about that because that's almost like life. (laughs) This striking a pose, is that, does this have a, I mean, I understand what it means, of course, but is there It's like freezing a moment in a way. But is is there any kind of special significance? To that? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, it's like freezing, um, 
a moment. I was quite like that with garments as well, like the, always the show kind of show pictures I had never liked. So, so we always did like lookbooks afterwards where it had to be kind of, you know, the beauty that I see or whatever. <laughs> uh, freeze that or I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Should but, we? I, but yeah. No, sorry. Admir and I uh, warned each other that we're both interrupters. Yeah. Before we started this talk. Uh, I interrupted you. It's okay. Should we see if there's one more question? Yes. Yes. Any more questions? No questions? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come on. Uh, no, I was Give just us a question. <laughs> no, I am actually curious about this. Um, you mentioned earlier dating apps, and you said yeah. something about a dating app deal breaker. Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> because there'll be like these lists, you uh, know. Have you not been on dating apps? <laughs> well, everybody's talking about deal breakers, and everybody's talking about vibes. And you know, like on apps, there will be like lists of kind of what you like and what you don't like. And I guess I went on a date <laughs> <laughs> and there was this, uh, yeah, there was this, this kind of talk about, yeah, deal breakers and what just doesn't work. So it's just about like this time where everything is very kind of fragile. Everything seems to be a deal breaker in a way. <laughs> so it's like deal breaking a vibe kind of, I don't know, it's like um, uh, sabotaging a moment in a way <laughs> by like doing something wrong. Also kind of like talking about there's like an angle that doesn't work and then there's like, yeah, it's almost like I'm now kind of interested in these type of things. I, did I answer? No. <laughs> Deal breaker is like, yeah. Yeah. It's like fake a patina. So it's like, that was the part was kind of about, my impression in art is that it's something that is kind of like a bit destroyed or rough or more like bodily, almost has like a greater emotion kind of attached to it. So I found myself kind of like, you know, roughing up this work. So that was kind of like taking a patent deal break a vibe and so just like, I, th I thought that was kind of self explanatory, <laughs> but it isn't. <laughs> it is just kind of, yeah, it's like um, deal breaking a vibe. I, I, yeah, I don't think it's a thing. But it is, you know. Everything's a deal breaker. Like, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, it also sounds a bit like you're having, you enjoy spending time as if it was, I don't know, it's as the day. But I can like imagine you in your studio practice, enjoying spending time and having your meals and listening to the radio <laughs> with your sculptures, with the, the fabric, and you go. Or, uh, it is all, you, yeah. Is that some, because it's a relationship with this fabric, I guess. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's also like this kind of collagist yeah. method. I think when uh, I went to school, this was like too early 2000, there was already kind of this maybe feeling of like nothing is new, but the mix can be new. So I think there's been always this kind of like gathering information, kind of looking for connections, discovering the connection. So it's like, uh, you know, that's this is like pedestals and there's sequence on it. Like, but what else is it in a way, you know? And like, so it is this kind of, yeah. 
yeah, collaging all this information into a pose <laughs> or something like that. Last question, if there are any. Thank you so much for coming and thank you thank for you. bringing this. Uh, yeah. Uh, I want to say this guy, but I don't. Mm. Thank you for bringing this along. It's been a, such a nice conversation partner. You have to. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Thank you, uh, everyone who's watching from home. Um, have a lovely evening. And for those here, there's a bit of soup left. You can maybe. make a sculpture about a bad date, can't <laughs> you? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. We, you can absolutely do that. <laughs> I think there's a lot of sculptures about bad dates <laughs> yeah. out there. Thanks, everyone.